Welcome to Taproot, where we plumb the depth and encompass the breadth of liberty. My name is Todd Williams, and I'm honored to serve as your host. And in today's episode, we will be discussing the six forms of government as posited by Aristotle. With me is Marshall Wilson, husband, father, citizen, teacher, and former state legislator, infantry officer, and Christian missionary in the Peruvian Amazon. Marshall, how are you today? I'm doing great, Todd. Thanks for putting up with me again. It's good to see you. Absolutely. It's my pleasure to be with you this evening and all of our listeners. Uh, So would you please jump jump right in with me and uh, let's start talking about the six forms of government, because I'm sure you have much to say about that. Probably way more than I should. (laughs) But let's start with why it's important. Uh, If you're going to discuss any concept, it's very important to understand where it comes from, what it actually means. So when we talk about government, it's important to understand uh, what the capabilities of government are, what forms it can take, that sort of thing. Now, we have already touched on the fact that there is one singular purpose, one valid purpose for government, which is what? To secure the natural rights. Go ahead. To secure the natural rights. Absolutely. Absolutely. Of each individual citizen, right? Life, and, liberty, uh, and the pursuit of happiness. Yes, sir. And and the uh, the quick the the shortest distance to find documentation of that. Now, there's all sorts of documentation throughout the uh, the record of Western civilization, but the place that it's distilled for us as Americans and most available is in the U.S. Declaration, the American Declaration of Independence, and it states clearly. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You ready for this? That to secure these rights, these certain unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness with which we've been endowed by our creator, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. That is the one singular purpose for for government that is valid anywhere, anytime, among any men in any place. So you get the idea. So now we know what the purpose is. The real question is, what form should a government take if we understand its purpose? You understand that form follows function. If the function is to secure your individual natural rights, what form should it take? Well, long, long, long ago, Aristotle, posited six forms of government. And to this day, these are generally the forms of government we recognize. And to be quite honest with you, a lot of other people have tried through the ages to to say, well, this type of government is different from one of those six. But frankly, uh, there aren't really any other forms of government that fit that any other categories of forms of government uh, except these. Now, let's uh, let's discuss what, what makes them different. First of all, you've got the number of rulers is one of the uh, the categories right there. Then you've got ideal forms of government, and then you've got perverted forms of government. Before we dive off into the actual forms themselves, let's discuss what's the difference between the ideal form and the perverted form. 
frankly, what qualifies the form to be ideal within the category of the number of rulers is the one that is focused on securing the individual natural rights of each of the citizens. In other words, the one that is ruled for the purpose of securing the natural rights of the citizens. The perverted is the opposite of that. The government that is ruled for the purpose of depriving the citizens of their individual natural rights or with the effect, even if the, uh, even if the government claims that their purpose is to secure your rights, if the effect of their actions is to deprive you of the free exercise of your natural rights, and that's another word for liberty, or that's how I define liberty, and a lot of other people do as well, is the opportunity to freely exercise your rights. That's what liberty is. So if the effect of the government is to deprive you of the opportunity to freely exercise your rights, it is a perverted form. So basically there, there are ideal and perverted forms of government by one ruler, by a few rulers, by many rulers. All right, so let's go through the ideal ones real quick if you don't mind. So a monarchy, just stick with me here. I understand that we as Americans hate the idea of a monarchy, but the monarch we're describing here is the ideal monarch who is dedicated to securing the individual natural rights of the citizens of the nation he rules, okay? So that is the ideal rule of one is a monarch who is dedicated to that. All right, aristocracy is a rule of the few. Few, now how are those few chosen? Well, in an aristocracy, and I understand we as Americans have a real problem with aristocracy, but if you'll forgive me, we're talking about philosophical forms here and the fact that the name aristocracy, aristocracy has often been given to its corrupted form or its perverted form, which is oligarchy, doesn't mean that was actually an aristocracy. In the, in the philosophical forms, aristocracy is pure, meaning that it is focused and that it's effective in securing the individual natural rights of the citizens. So if there are a few citizens who rule a nation in the name of all the other citizens, and actually affect the security, actually uh, act in a way that make that creates security for the individual natural rights, the liberties and rights of each individual citizen. That is an aristocracy, a polity. Would, would it would it be fair on that on that note, Marshall? Would it be fair to say that uh, maybe aristocracy has a bad name because a lot of people think that an oligarchy started out as an aristocracy and in fact it really didn't um, well no actually most oligarchies do start off as aristocracies i know that they most do but i'm saying would, wouldn't it be fair to say that people may think that uh aristocracies are bad because oligarchies are bad by nature right, right. so what they're seeing is the corrupted form of the original right but, but what we're talking about with aristocracy is the pure form that is actually formed and actually functions to secure the individual natural rights of each citizen. And then you have the, the rule of the many. Now, in our society today, in postmodern America, people keep referring to the rule of the many, the good rule of the many, as a democracy. But that is not, in fact, correct. The good rule of the many is called a polity. And it's literally where all of the people serve each other. All of the people work to secure the rights of each other. And in my mind, this is, this is absolutely the perfect type of government. Rather so, than someone, yes, sir. So, Marshall, uh, the word polity, I would assume that that's where the Russian Politburo came from, correct? <laughs> well, it's also where the word polit uh, uh, politician came from and where the word... Uh, and where yeah. the word uh, cosmopolitan came from. Cosmopolitan, right. Yeah, it's, it's the root of quite a few words, but uh, polity means people working together to secure each other's individual natural rights and basically to look out for each other. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you know, what you're talking about there is otherwise known as utopia, which literally means nowhere, because in our human experience, that's never going to happen, Right. Right. So we'll get into why that is in just a minute. So the perverted forms, the perverted form of rule by one here is listed as tyranny, but I would prefer to say dictatorship rather than tyranny. And there's a good reason for that. 
tyranny is a very general term. You can have the tyranny of one few or many. In other words, if the few exercise tyranny over you, that's actually an oligarchy. If the many exercise a tyranny over you, that's actually democracy, mob rule. In other words, the mob is in charge. The corrupt many hold all the power. So what we're really talking about when we use up there on the, the perverted form of rule of one is not tyranny. That's too general of a term. Specifically, it's dictatorship. And I hope that clarifies some things. Uh, yeah. I like this, this graphic fairly well, except for that one thing, and also the fact that it leaves off the reason that seems some are ideal and some are perverted, which is the ideal ones serve the individual natural rights of, of the citizens. The perverted actually serve the whims of the rulers, which means that they deprive the individual uh, citizens of their natural rights. Yes, sir. Yeah, and to me, tyranny almost seems like the action. That's what's happening. It's a. I think it's it's a state of being. It's a it's a, a situation. Is tyranny. Right. Whereas dictatorship is a form of government that enacts tyranny. Right. Uh, oligarchy is a form of government that enacts tyranny. Democracy is a form of government that enacts tyranny. Right. Uh, a lot of people will say, "Well, Wilson, you're crazy. Democracy is freedom." No, democracy is literally mob rule. It means that every man gets one vote and that the only thing that matters, the, the law of the land, is literally the will of the people. Well, why is that a problem? Well, because all men are corrupt. <laughs> it's that simple. So yes. the, the, the basis of our form of government, it's got two legs. And the two legs upon which our government was founded are all men are created equal and endowed with certain unalienable rights, the same set of unalienable rights, right? That, that's what it means to be equal. We have the exact same set of rights, and they are certain and unalienable. It doesn't mean we're the same height. We have the same color hair. We make as much money. Any of that. We have the same capabilities. means we have the same rights, which then trans, transfers into our, since we have the same set of rights, we should have equal representation or equal uh, uh, protection under the law for those rights. Right. right. And not only that, but because everyone has equal protection under the law, we all have equal responsibility to the law. So if I have equal protection under the law with you, Todd, that means that you don't have the right necessarily in most situations to punch me in the face. Yeah, I, I can understand why you might want to, but you don't have the right to unprovoked punch me in the face and that you have to be held accountable to the law because you deprive me of the free exercise of my right to not right. get punched in the face. Right. Okay. And that reminds so, me of the, reminds me of the example we used in one of the earlier episodes where you were talking about if I'm swinging my arm around and I like to swing my arm and you get too close to me and I hit you in the face, then <laughs> right. Right. are you, are you depriving me of my right to swing my arm? Right. And what we really hope to get to here is a society where everyone recognizes all of this. Everyone uh, values their own rights so greatly that they can't help but recognize that their fellow men have the same rights and that they have to secure the rights of their fellow men in order to have their own rights secured. Right. That's what we're, we're hoping for is to actually achieve that polity. The problem is the second pillar upon which our government is founded the first being that we all have equal rights, all men are uh, created equal. The second is all men are corrupt. Right. Every single one of us. Yes. And when I taught this class to high school seniors as a one of their first college level courses, uh, invariably someone would say, well, what about you? And I'd say, yes, absolutely. I am corrupt. Yes. I hate my corruption. I fight it every day. I ask God to help me. My wife certainly helps me <laughs> to recognize when I'm behaving in an, in an unacceptable manner. But right. yes, we are all corrupt, every single one of us. So our government recognizes that we are all created equal. In other words, we all have the, the right to self-rule. Um, Locke, I believe, says that the natural state of man is freedom. Natural state. Right. The problem is... We can't manage freedom because we're corrupt. Because we're corrupt, which is, yes. Which is the only reason we need a government. Right. If men were angels, they wouldn't require a government. 
if we all live the way we were supposed to, we would live in a polity where we're all equal and we all look out for each other and there would be nothing to worry about. Correct. Not going to happen. Correct. Because we're corrupt. All right. So when we shoot at polity, which people in postmodern America actually call democracy, what you end up with is democracy, which is basically hell on earth. Right. Uh, now, it's for the same reason that you mentioned with aristocracy and oligarchy, that people call what they're aiming at polity. They call it democracy because they don't understand that polity is the pure form of democracy, is the corrupted form, the perverted form. Absolutely. And like I, you and I were talking earlier, I, I hear all of the news agencies and everyone say, you know, we need to protect our democracy. And I, I feel like, you know, I, those people don't know what they're saying. Nope, they don't. All right. I mean, so let's Venezuela is a democracy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So this this concept, the Aristotelian typology of governments, uh, was in the the uh, uh, inculcated into Greek philosophy, uh, political studies, and all that sort of thing. Uh, you know, four thousand years ago or so. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, Polybius learned this, of course, just like all young uh, young uh, Greek men studying to to learn to to rule or to to be a part of the government would have learned. And uh, he developed, now this, this wasn't a new idea with Polybius, but he sort of formulated it, the idea of anacyclosis, anacyclosis. So the idea of anacyclosis is a cycle of governments. And the concept is really simple. And I, I, I challenge you to go back and study the history of any government that we can find historical records on and see if the, this cycle doesn't work. Is it played out by that government? So the idea is you start off with three men. And I'm talking about we're starting at the very beginning. You right. know, if you, uh, if you hold to the Judeo-Christian perspective, we're talking about God created man. And frankly, even if you don't hold to that perspective, that perspective is the foundation of uh, building a government that secures our rights. Let's let's talk about it again. All men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. If you remove the creator from that, from that equation, there is no reason to believe that you have any rights at all. And the only, the only um, archon, the only form of power that has the right to grant rights or the capability to grant rights, if you remove an overarching, all-powerful creator from that equation is the government. And the problem with that is the government can then take your rights away and you can't say anything about it because they own you. Because men are corrupt. Because men are corrupt, but they own you because there is no overarching power. Government is the greatest power. Therefore, whatever they do is right. Right. So one of the great things about our, our form of government is that the founders of our government appeal to a higher power, a greater wisdom, uh, a higher standard than that of philosophy or politics or power. Their entire uh, foundation for all of this is there is someone beyond all of this who created all of this, and he, in his infinite wisdom, created each man with certain inalienable rights that are an integral part of what you are as a human being. And by the way, throughout this, um, throughout this, you know, these episodes, however many episodes we end up doing, when we're discussing philosophy, and I use the term man, we're talking about the, the creature man, the mankind man. Yes, mankind, more or less, but we're not specifically talking about the male of the creature. We're talking about the, the creature, each individual member of that uh, um, uh, of that creature. Yes. Every single iteration that of that species. Creature. Yes. Well, okay. Um, yes, species, if you want to go that far, but that, that opens well, up a whole can I was of just I was just thinking if you use the word elephant, you don't know what sex you're talking about. You're just talking about elephants. Right. All right, so uh, back to where we're, anacyclosis. So let's discuss what anacyclosis is. Anacyclosis is effectively the, um, the 
fri friction, the effect of friction on the cycle or on the uh, the forms of government that, that tears them all down. And that friction comes about because all men are corrupt. So you've got corrupt citizens, you've got corrupt leaders, you've got corrupt rulers, you've got corrupt business people. We're all corrupt. We're all looking out for what we want, which almost immediately puts us into the perverted column, the, the perverted form of government, no matter which form of government we try to form. So what ends up happening with the... Uh, um, the anacyclosis, the cycle of change of governments through the six forms that uh, that Aristotle posited is that, like I say, we start off with God making man, and man is by nature, according to Locke, free. That's the way that we were created. We have all these rights, we have all these liberties, and we are free, but we were uncorrupted. We were made perfect. The moment we became corrupted, we were no longer able to be free because we were corrupted and we were unable to meet these ideals. So if mankind had never been corrupted, having one guy in charge of all government of mankind would never have been a problem because that guy would have been perfect and the people he ruled would have been perfect and everything would have worked out perfectly. That's monarchy. Once again, the philosophical type of monarchy. Aristocracy, if a few people had different responsibilities in the government and, and were in charge of different programs or whatever, then and everybody was perfect, then that would have worked out fine. Right? Yes. Okay. Well, the problem is we don't need a government if we're all perfect. Yes. Because if we are, if we are all perfect, if each one of us is perfect and the entire group of us is perfect, as an organization or as a as a group, we don't need an organization because we are a polity. Right. We rule ourselves and therefore we rule the whole society as a whole. Right. Right. Everyone would operate with integrity. Everyone would be kind. They would consider their fellow man, you know, all of yes, those things. Exactly. So what we started out with was actually polity. Right. Yes. Polity devolved into democracy. Why? Well, because once men became corrupt, they started seeking out their own desires. They wanted what they wanted, no matter what it cost anybody else. They weren't interested in, in securing their friends or their neighbors' uh, uh, rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. They were too busy pursuing their own rights, right? Yes. To the exclusion, often, of the rights of their, their neighbors. Well, that's democracy. Every single person pursuing their own desires, the exercise of their own rights to the exclusion of everyone else's rights. That is democracy in a very literal sense. And the, okay, whichever, so what, whichever mob forms that has the most power is the one who's in charge. Right. Whether that be by force or, you know, money well, that's, or. That's that's down the line. So what we've got right now is everyone is fighting against everyone. Right. And then if a strong man comes up, once again, a corrupt man among corrupt men uh, is able to raise himself up through his great strength. Or if a group of people are able to raise themselves up through their great strength, they become either a dictatorship or an oligarchy. Oligarchy. Yeah. And that's what you're describing now is either you end up with with all the people fighting each other. Sooner or later, some of the people are going to side with some of the other people and then they'll go to war with each other. Instead of every man fighting every man, some of the men will fight some of the other men, right? Right. All right. And, and the fact is that the rulers of those groups will either be oligarchs or or they will be dictators. dictators. Yes. One way or another, they will be tyr uh, tyrannical. Right. Okay. So let's say, let's go ahead and say that what happens is we have a dictator who rises up, establishes himself as the great ruler of a certain group of people, the chieftain the king, the petty king, the tyrant, whatever. And he steps up and says, all right, guys, this is the way we do things because this is who we are. And over time, let's say he actually develops this idea or he is inspired to believe that his job as the dictator, as the one who speaks, dictate, you know, take dictation, I speak, you write, so let it be written, so let it be done. A dictator is someone whose word is law. Right. Yep. And that is pretty tyrannical. So let's say we've got this guy who is a dictator. 
And he decides that there is more to life than simply getting whatever he wants, whenever he wants it. And what he really wants to do is to ensure that his people, the people that he rules, he now wants to serve by keeping them safe, protecting their rights, their rights to life, to live where they want, to, to eat whatever they want, to, you know, to live the way that they want to live, the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Right. Well, that would describe a monarchy. Now, once again, because all men are corrupt, it would not be a perfect monarchy. The man's not perfect. So at some point, it's still a dictatorship. Yep. All right. And, and going through history, uh, we can observe many monarchies and we can see kings who were gracious and good men. But ultimately, they were still corrupt and evil is done on people or whatever. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Now, there was that one guy who was a good king, but uh, I think they killed him for that. I think so, they did. so let's say you actually have someone who is attempting to perform the, uh, uh, the service of being a true monarch. King Arthur, right? Yes. All right. Sooner or later, he trips, he falls, he's corrupt. He does something that's for his own benefit rather than for his people's. Um, you know, I was a, a, I was an officer in the army. Uh, my entire life was about serving my soldiers, ensuring that they had everything they wanted. And I can tell you that I can actually describe moments where I chose not to look out for my soldiers because I was tired or because I was hungry or because I was angry or because whatever. And I regret them, and I have repented of them, and I have confessed them to the soldiers themselves. But that doesn't change the fact that I behaved in a tyrannical rather than a servant leader manner, right? Okay, so you've got this, this guy. Let's go ahead and call it a monarchy for argument's sake. Guy actually establishes a monarchy. Over time, that monarchy actually devolves into the tyrannical perverted form, which is dictatorship. Right. Then what happens? Well, a group of the wealthy or powerful who are under the king but over the people, they decide to depose the king and that they will rule because they are better men. And it's possible, it's even likely that they're better men than the king, right. that they would make better decisions, that they would serve the benefit of the people because they're closer to the people, right? And yet, and still and always, at some point, they just really enjoy having that power and getting to go on the vacation down by the, you know, down by the ocean and the benefit that that brings them. And, you know, yeah, it costs the people a little bit of extra money for them to have that. But, you know, gosh, they're just serving the people so hard. And don't they just deserve that? They deserve and they're doing it. so much for you. Shouldn't you just give them a little more tax just, money just so they can afford to fill it down at the seaside? Just, right. a, little, just a little more. All right. So, so when, when does when does the little more stop? You know, that's the question. It, it just never, continues. never, because we are so corrupt, Todd. Yes. You know, and uh, so the aristocracy, which deposed the tyrannical dictator who used to be the servant monarch, they depose him, they take over, and they start to corrupt over time. Now, of course, there's a, a famous saying <clears throat> that... Uh, that power corrupts and ultimate power corrupts absolutely. Well, I, I, I disagree with that. I do. And, and here's why. I don't believe that power corrupts you. I believe that we are already corrupt and that having power simply allows us to enact our corruption, our inherent corruption that we already have. Yes. And the more power we have, the more capability we have to enact that inherent corruption. And on top of that, the less power other people have to hold us accountable for. That's right. my, my perspective on it. I understand the, the intent, and I agree with the intent of that expression, but I, I don't think that the power makes you corrupt. I think that your inherent corruption is you're enabled to enact it the more power you have. You're, you're more enabled to enact it. That's, that may be splitting hairs. I don't know. Maybe a bit pedantic, but that's the way I see things, and I think it's an important distinction. No, I agree with you on that. I think that the power is absolutely not what corrupts man. Um, but but the more power man has, the more likely he is to uh, exercise his authority over others or or show his corruption. Right. That's thank you. That's uh, that's exactly where I'm going with that. So the aristocracy devolves into its corrupt form, the oligarchy, and over time, the people become disgusted with the oligarchy because it's so corrupt. And they say, you know what? 
we don't want to be ruled. We want to rule ourselves. We want to make our own decisions. So the people rise up and destroy the oligarchy and they seize power for themselves. And for all of about 32 seconds, you have a polity. <laughs> Everyone is singing about, uh, you know, equality and fraternity and, you know, liberty. And uh, and then they start chopping off people's heads. We've you know? taken down the evil king. Yeah. Yep. And but that's then, the way it is because... But but, then the people, but then the people who now have risen to power, like you said, they're going to behead all of the king's staff, you know, because hey, these people didn't, they don't jive with us, you know. Right, right. So you have this this polity for all of 32 seconds, which immediately devolves into democracy. Everybody wants what they want. And uh, the whole cycle just runs over and over and over again. And the problem is that often what you have is someone decides that a new form of government is what we need. We need, you know, if the monarchy is not working for us because, because it devolved into a dictatorship, what we really need is for these wise and learned and wealthy men who have been trying to keep the king on the right path you know, while ruling over us, the peasants, that maybe what we really need is for them to be in charge because they understand more about our lives. And so the the aristocracy takes over and, you know, it falls into oligarchical behaviors. And so we say, man, you know, we can't even trust these guys. So we're going to depose them and we're going to take over. And then, of course, it's me and Todd fighting over the last steak in the grocery store. I don't know. Does that sound like something you've seen recently? Not me and Todd necessarily, but people fighting in stores over goods. Yeah. By the way, Marshall and I don't fight over steaks. We just share them, cut them in half and <laughs> yes, share them. We do. Yes, we do. <laughs> but uh, you get the idea here. So this is anacyclosis, the cycle of changing governments, changing forms of governments posited by Polybius. So you can see why, uh, you know, Aristotle's forms are so critical to understanding what government is and what it's supposed to be and how it's supposed to function. And then Polybius explains just the, the, the way that it keeps falling into itself. It keeps collapsing into the next form. And the reason is because we're all corrupt. Well, the genius of our founders was not that they were perfect men. They were corrupt men. The genius is that they knew they were. They recognized that they were corrupt, yes. They recognized and accepted it, and they built an entire government for corrupt people who wanted to be good people, in which those good people could serve or choose who they wanted to serve, corrupt people who could serve them in their attempt to maintain their liberty, which is the opportunity to freely exercise their rights. And I and and, and just to back up what I just said, so that what what I just said, you know, I can I can support with documentation, the preamble to the Constitution of the United States of America. First of all, the Constitution is the charter of the government. If you've ever formed a club or a church or an organization or a business, you know that you have a charter. And the charter defines what the business or club or organization or church is, explains what its responsibilities are, explains what its powers and authorities are, and then explains what its limitations are. It defines it, right? Just, yes. just exactly like the limits of my physical body define, you know, the space that I inhabit. That's that's what a charter does. Well, the Constitution of the United States is literally the charter of the government, not of the nation, not of the society, not of the people, but of the government that the people created to serve them by securing their individual natural rights. Yes. And here's what the, peop the people said when they formed, when they wrote this charter that formed this government for that purpose. So once again, the government was formed for the purpose of securing the individual natural rights, the, the certain and uh, unalienable rights with which each man has been endowed by his creator, right? According to the Declaration of Independence, the yep. preamble to the Constitution of the United States says that this is why we form this government. We, the people in order to form a more, more perfect union, more perfect than the union that was formed under the Articles of uh, Confederation previously. It was their first attempt at a, at a central government. Instead, they formed this federal government. 
We, the people, in order to form a more, a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, to our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, on down through the ages, to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. The purpose behind the foundation of the government was to secure the blessings of liberty while also providing for the common defense, promoting the general welfare. And welfare here was not a government program. It was a general term that meant generally being okay. General being, welfare, you know, yes. Busted, un, unattacked, you know, allowed to do with your life what you want to in general. So that's that's what this is really all about. And, and next episode, we're going to discuss the actual formation of that government and and the brilliance, the genius of creating a hybrid government that was actually formed of all three of the ideal forms of government. We do not have a democracy. Right. We have a republic founded on a constitution which was created according to the principles of all three forms of ideal government. Right. So a constitutional and, uh, republic or maybe a representative republic. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Now, it's important to understand, though, that you can have a constitutional representative republic that is not formed according to these principles. Right. I mean, you understand that the uh, <laughs> the Soviet republics called themselves constitutional republics. Yes. All right. So they were formed. They were constitutional republics formed by different principles than the ones we're talking about here. Right. So what we're going to discuss in our next episode is the actual form of government that the United States of America is, and it is not one of these uh, one of these six. According to the Constitution, it is actually a hybridization of the three ideal forms, monarchy, aristocracy, and polity. And that is the form of government that we were left with uh, when the founders created the Constitution. Now, of course, we will have to deal with the fact that it wasn't perfect because men are corrupt. And the hugest imperfection in the entire process was the existence of slavery while we were building a government to secure the natural rights of each individual human being, each individual man in the nation. We allowed, our forefathers allowed, for some men to be defined as something other than men. In other words, not worthy of the protection, not do the protection of this government they were creating. It's a shame. It's a dishonor on all of us. But I tell you what, we will get through it. We will discuss it. We'll figure out how it worked. And uh, we will actually figure out, we'll actually figure out how that government was formed, why it was formed the way it was, and how we can get back to that ideal form, but also, also cause that ideal form to function according to its ideal purpose. And be accountable. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now that 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 includes, that encompasses the fact that we are still corrupt men yes <clears throat> yeah and i love the part in the preamble that says to ourselves and our posterity because uh the founders thought you know they they wanted to make uh liberty generational you know they weren't just thinking right. about themselves they were thinking about free men forever you know or or yes. so yes. i really i really like that yeah they didn't go through the revolutionary war and by the way, at the end of the Declaration of Independence, you understand the Declaration of Independence was not just them saying, okay, we're done here. We want a divorce or whatever. We want a divorce from, from Great Britain. Right. It was literally a declaration of war against the most powerful empire on the nation. Absolutely. I mean, most powerful empire on the planet. Right. They chose to declare war, not just for themselves, but for my grandkids. They had my grandkids in mind for ourselves and for our posterity. Now, if that is not worth learning about, if that's not worth studying, if that's not worth trying to restore that republic that they built in that form, nothing is. Right. 
So, and like uh, like you said, again against the most powerful empire in the world at that time. I mean, the you know Great Britain's navy was tremendous, uh, and you know in many cases we're just a ragtag bunch of folks that were basically farmers with rifles fighting against a a, a military, an army. Yes. And uh, if you read those stories of the revolution and so many of those things that happened were just uh, amazing, and I would say miraculous in many cases. I, I would agree. And yet what they were pursuing, what they were pursuing was the opportunity for their great, 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 great grandkids to live, to live inundated in the blessings of liberty. Yep. And they were willing at the end of the Declaration of Independence, they said, with reliance upon God, with reliance upon God, we offer our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Yep. Lives, fortunes, sacred honor. That means they were, we're willing to give anything. It. We're not going to get into it right now, but the average postmodern American, if you ask them if they're willing to offer their life, their fortune, and their sacred honor to secure the individual natural rights of somebody else's great-great-grandkids, I don't think they can even conceive of the question. No. Not because they're stupid, but because no. they don't have this concept uh, firmly planted in their mind. So yeah. the, the entire purpose for which you and I have formed this podcast is so we can help people to see this. All right. So I have run my mouth more than enough, and I'm really looking forward to the next episode where we actually talk about how the uh, U.S. government was founded by the American nation. Nation, government, two different things, right? Yes. The, Amer the, the U.S. government was formed by the American nation, by the people of the American nation, and for the purpose of securing their individual liberties and those of their kids many generations hence. And we're going to talk about the actual structure of that government and why it was built the way it was and why it needs to return to that formal function and structure. Thanks, Tom. I really Absolutely. appreciate it. Yeah, great, great episode tonight. And uh, we look forward to tuning in with all of our listeners at the next episode. I'm really looking forward to it too. Take care. Thanks, Marshall.